Welcome to Whitehorse Radar's demonstration video presentation. My name is Clive Alabaster and this video presentation covers the subject of interference between pulsed radars. This is a complex topic and accordingly this video presentation is not pitched at beginner's level. This video has been produced to showcase Whitehorse Radar's research and development capability and as a sample to promote our suite of similar but longer videos that teach various aspects of radar and therefore this video may be freely distributed. Some of the most difficult interference to cope with is that caused by transmissions from another similar radar because the waveform conforms to what the receiving radar expects and so is readily accepted. The mutual interference between similar radars will fall within the operating bandwidth of the victim radar, although may typically be on a neighbouring channel. Nevertheless, the transmissions from one radar can have a devastating effect on another radar. The problem of mutual interference goes both ways. Both radars are likely to interfere with each other. What's more, the receiver could compound the problem if not properly designed. Solutions based on unique features in the transmitted waveform demand similarly unique signal processing and raise issues about the interchangeability of subsystems, since both transmitter and processor must be changed together. So it is preferable to avoid transmitting potentially interfering signals on neighbouring channels and avoid accepting interference within the receiver front end in the first place rather than trying to process your way out of the problems. There is a place for processing but the techniques described here are RF solutions that avoid incurring mutual interference in the first place. They are most relevant to pulsed radars. I shall start by describing the problem of mutual interference between like radars. The figure to the right shows the devastating effect interference can have on a Doppler radar as we see it being switched on at interval 25, halfway up the display. The interference comes from a similar radar which is periodically sweeping through the victim's receiver band. Neither radar has any measures to reduce interference. Appreciating the problem is a large part of the battle and it shows that if mutual interference is to be controlled one must address both the transmitted waveform and the receiver design. First we shall address what can be done with the transmitter half of the problem. For pulsed radars, the spectral spread into neighbouring channel frequencies can be controlled by appropriate shaping of the pulse. This is a well-established technique used by many systems. I shall describe different shaping functions that may be used and compare their performances. In pulsed radar receivers, the receiver is also pulsed since it will be protected by switches that isolate the receiver during the transmitted pulse but which allow the reception of echoes between pulses. These protection switches could potentially also impart some shaping to their switching profile. But this is difficult to implement. A rapid receiver protection switch, one essentially providing no shaping, could make matters worse and receiver filtering on its own will offer little improvement. A solution is described here that depends on the relative timings of two receiver protection switches and a filter between the two switches. The situation has been modelled for a typical airborne fire control radar operating in a long range track while scan mode and results are presented that show a considerable degree of improvement over filtering alone. Finally, I will make a quick summary to remind you of the main points. More information can be obtained from the reference given at the bottom. To appreciate the problem, let's imagine two like radars operating within range of each other. 
such as the two fire control radars within the nose cones of the strike aircraft shown here. The picture illustrates the worst situation, where the two radars are in each other's main beam, but main beam to side lobe and even side lobe to side lobe scenarios can be problematic within certain ranges. The emissions from the far radar are a sequence of pulses of potential interference, shown as the topmost waveform, A, on the right. The closer radar has a receiver gating function shown in the middle waveform, B, on the right-hand side, and so it receives fragments of interference, C, corresponding to when the transmitted pulses arrive at the right-hand radar and when its receiver is open and this is shown in the lowest waveform on the right. Given that the pulsed operation of the two radars is not synchronized and there is an unknown range delay between the two radars, the receiver gating of the receiving radar cannot provide protection against the transmissions from the far radar. The width of the fragment of interference received by the closer radar depends on the relative timings of the two radars and their separation distance and so will, in general, vary with time. If both radars operate on a 50% duty ratio, then one edge of the interference fragment will be defined by the transmitter of the interference pulses, and the other edge by the receiver gating of the victim. For lower duty ratios, it becomes more likely that both edges will be defined by the transmitter of the interference pulses, although the receiver gating can never be discounted. This interference may well be on a different channel frequency to that of the receiver, but its pulse modulation may cause its spectrum to encroach into the receiver's channel and give rise to problems. If we bear in mind that the bandwidth of a pulse signal is given approximately by the inverse of its pulse width, then narrow fragments of interference may have a very wide spectral spread, such that they spread into neighbouring channels. In this case, the width of the fragment of interference is likely to be changing continuously, giving a variation in its bandwidth. As the pulsed modulation of the interference and the receiver gating drift in and out of phase, the severity of the problem also varies. Furthermore, the definition of the rising and falling edges of the interference fragments will also swap between the transmitted modulation and the receiver gating. The whole situation is in a state of constant flux and both the transmitting radar and receiving radar play their part in creating and therefore controlling the interference. The next few slides show some examples of this. Consider a situation in which both radars operate on precisely the same PRF of 250 kHz, that is, a pulse repetition interval of 4 microseconds, and a pulse width of 2 microseconds, giving a 50% duty ratio. This may be typical of a high PRF mode for long-range track while scan. We have a transmitting radar that emits pulses that fall within the RF bandwidth of a receiving radar but on a different channel frequency. Let us, for example, imagine that the receiver normally downconverts its own returns to an intermediate frequency, an IF, of 100 MHz, but that the incoming interference from the transmitting radar is downconverted to 160 MHz, so is some 60 MHz above its own channel. If we further imagine that the distance between the two radars is such that the transmitted pulses are offset from the receiver gating by 1.75 microseconds, then the resulting fragments of interference have widths of 0.25 microseconds. We see the appropriate timings illustrated in the waveforms top right. The spectrum of the fragments of the interference pulses is shown bottom right. We see the spectrum centered at 160 MHz, but spreading over a wide bandwidth on account of the narrowness of the fragments. The interference at 100 MHz is a mere 34 dBs down 
on its peak level and is accepted by the victim receiver. If now the two radars close, the timing offset becomes one microsecond, resulting in one microsecond pulse fragments of interference. The wider pulses of interference result in a reduced spectral spread, and this time the interference level at 100 MHz is 46 dB below its peak. The absolute value of this peak will, however, be 6 dB higher than the previous case because the longer pulse fragments contain more energy. Nevertheless, there is still a 6 dB reduction in the absolute level of in-band interference. Closing yet further has now reduced the timing offset to half a microsecond and the pulse fragments are now 1.5 microseconds wide. The wider pulse fragments reduce the spectral spread and the level at 100 MHz is now 49 dB below its peak. Again, this peak will have increased somewhat due to the increased energy in the fragments, but it still represents an improvement of 7.2 dB over the original case, ignoring the effects of the change in range. The previous cases were all based on both radars operating on precisely the same PRF. In reality, there will inevitably be slight differences in PRF, even if they are intended to be nominally the same. Slight differences in PRF will cause a continuous drift in the timing offsets between the two, and so the width of the pulse fragments will always be changing. Some example timings using different PRFs have been modelled here, and we can see from the waveforms on the top right how the width of the interference fragments is modulated. The spectrum of the 8 pulse sequence of interference fragments is shown bottom right and is somewhat messy and lacks the regular structure of a constant width pulse waveform. The interference at 100 MHz is about 45 dB below its peak. This case also illustrates how the rising and falling edges of the interference pulses are defined by both the pulsing of the transmitting radar and the gating signal providing protection of the victim receiver. A full solution to the interference problem must therefore address both the transmitter and receiver. A solution to just one either the transmitter or receiver, will have minimal benefit. We'll start by considering the transmitter solution. The traditional approach to minimising the spectral spread of a pulsed radar waveform into neighbouring channels is pulse shaping. Let's start by considering rectangular pulses, that is, pulses having a very rapid rise and fall time. Ideally, the rise and fall times should be infinitely fast for perfectly rectangular pulses, but this is not practical. On the left, we see one cycle of a waveform of a 100 MHz carrier having a PRI of 4 microseconds and pulse width of 1.5 microseconds. The rise and fall times of the pulses are both 1 nanosecond. We cannot resolve the sine wave variation at 100 MHz and so the pulse appears as a solid black region. The right hand graph shows the power spectrum of this waveform. We can see its peak centred at the 100 MHz carrier frequency and sidebands extending above and below the carrier frequency but decaying away at ever greater frequency offsets from its peak. The spectrum actually consists of a series of discrete sidebands at intervals of the PRF, that is 250 kHz, but individual sidebands cannot be resolved here and so we see a continuum of black. Nevertheless, the peak values of the sideband can be read from the plot. For example, at 160 MHz, the sidebands have decayed to around 50 dB below the peak level of the carrier, or minus 50 dBc, as we say. 
The sidebands will be much reduced if we shape the rise and fall profiles of the pulses. A popular shaping function is the Hamming function. The left-hand plot shows the original rectangular pulses in black overlaid by a Hamming-shaped pulse in blue. The Hamming shape is akin to a cosine function sitting on top of a small pedestal. The spectrum of the Hamming-shaped pulses is shown on the right in blue. The black spectrum of the rectangular pulses is also shown for comparison. The Hamming function has a very low first sideband at minus 42 dBc. The sidebands continue to decay away slowly with increasing frequency offset and reach approximately minus 68 dBc at 160 MHz. Another popular shaping function is the Han function and its waveform is shown in red superimposed on the black rectangular pulse waveform. This is also based on a cosine function but without any pedestal and so reduces to zero at the pulse start and end times. Its spectrum is shown in red on the right again with the black spectrum of the rectangular pulses for comparison. The hand function gives a first sideband which is minus 32 dBc and so is somewhat higher than that of the Hamming function. However, the hand function results in sidebands that decay much more rapidly with increasing frequency offset than the Hamming function. The decay is 18 dB per octave and results in a much reduced spectral spread. This time, the sidebands have decayed to around minus 127 dBc at 160 MHz, considerably lower than that of the Hamming function. We've seen how applying pulse shaping reduces the sidebands, but it has a few other effects on the spectrum. Firstly, Reducing the power at the start and end of a transmitted pulse reduces the energy in the pulse. After all, part of the pulse is missing, and that in turn reduces the detection performance of the radar. Secondly, increasing the rise and fall times of the pulse reduces the half power width of the pulse, which in turn causes an increase in the width of the main central lobe of its spectrum. Both these points are undesirable, but their effects are small for many of the popular shaping functions. The reduced sidebands, particularly into neighbouring channels which may be offset by several megahertz, outweighs the small disadvantages of the reduced energy and broadened main lobe. The loss in the peak response and increases in main lobe and peak side lobe levels are tabulated here for many of the popular shaping functions. This is not an exhaustive list of shaping functions, but nevertheless serves as a quick comparison for some of the popular ones. The Hamming and Han functions are popular as they provide effective control of the sidebands without compromising the transmitted energy or main lobe width too badly. This graph compares the spectra of the Hamming shaped pulses in blue with the Han shaped pulses in red. All things considered, the Han function is often perceived as being optimum due to its more rapid decay of sidebands with increasing frequency offset, in spite of its marginally greater loss in transmitted energy. It is worth pointing out a few other practical considerations with regards to pulse shaping. Firstly, spectral containment using pulse shaping may be required by RF licensing authorities so as to minimise interference for other users. This is particularly true of the HF band, that is 3 to 30 MHz, where there are many radar and communications applications vying for bandwidth. Secondly, once pulses have been shaped, it is necessary for all subsequent amplifier stages to preserve that shape. 
This requires that the transmitter must operate within its linear region and not in a saturated state, as is often the case for radar transmitters. Finally, imparting a precise shaping function may be difficult to achieve, particularly for some high-power microwave sources. One way to achieve this, however, is to use direct digital synthesis, or DDS, techniques to generate the low-power transmitter reference signal. DDS synthesizers store a digital representation of the transmitted pulse that is reproduced as the memory device is addressed sequentially, for example by feeding clock pulses to a counter. The storage device holds values that reproduce the appropriate amplitude weighting of the RF pulse, and such pulses can be reproduced as often as necessary according to the pulse repetition frequency, the PRF, of the radar. For radars that use a traditional high-power transmitter tube, such as a travelling wave tube, a TWT, a degree of pulse shaping is possible by allowing the grid modulator to define the pulse shape. Switching the grid modulator produces pulsed operation of TWTs, but they may typically impart a pulse rise and fall time in the order of a few tens of nanoseconds. The grid modulator can therefore apply a smooth rise and fall profile onto the leading and trailing edges of pulses, even when the TWT is run into saturation. Although this is only a modest degree of shaping, it can provide a useful degree of spectral containment and is a very practical solution. The graph here shows the spectrum of the same pulses considered in the earlier examples. The spectrum of the rectangular pulses of width 1.5 microseconds is given in black. Strictly speaking, these pulses have 1 nanosecond rise and fall times. Imparting a cosine profile over 30 nanoseconds results in the spectrum plotted in green, and a 100 nanosecond cosine rise and fall profile results in the light blue spectrum. As the rise and fall times increase from 1 to 30 to 100 nanoseconds, the sideband levels at 160 MHz drop from minus 51 dBc to minus 73 dBc to minus 93 dBc respectively, whilst incurring a negligibly small reduction in transmitted energy. As mentioned earlier, as the duty ratio reduces, there is an increased likelihood that both edges of interference fragments are defined by the transmitter, and so pulse shaping is of paramount concern. The gating of a receiver can, however, resharpen one edge of an interference pulse fragment, and this becomes more likely at high duty ratios. But the possibility of this happening cannot be ignored at low duty ratios. We shall now look at what can be done in the receiver to minimise interference. The block diagram shown here is fairly typical of superheterodyne receivers used in pulse radars. Received signals from the antenna enter on the left and progress to the right through a series of components. In a pulsed radar it is necessary to switch the receiver off during a transmitted pulse because some of the transmitted power could leak into the receiver or find its way into the receiver due to small mismatch reflections at the antenna. Transmitter leakage must be limited as it could overload the sensitive low noise amplifier within the receiver and be seen as a large target return at zero range and zero velocity. Typically, a large amount of isolation is required to avoid a false target return, but a more modest degree of isolation may be required to protect the low noise amplifier, the LNA. To this end, several switches may be used within the receiver. These are electronic switches that must switch at the radar PRF and must also switch rapidly 
from open to closed at the beginning of the receiving period, that is, after the end of the transmitted pulse, and from closed to open at the end of the receiving period, just before the start of a transmitted pulse. Rapid switching times in the order of a few nanoseconds are required and achieved, but this rapid switching can impart a rapid rise or fall profile on interference and, as we have just seen in the context of transmitter pulse shaping, if a pulse of RF has a rapid rise or fall time, it will have a broad spectrum of high-level sidebands extending into neighbouring channels. In the receiver block diagram shown here, received signals first go through a protection switch. This protects the sensitive LNA from transmitter leakage and reflections during the transmitted pulse. Received signals are then amplified by the LNA. Having a high gain, low noise amplifier as early as possible within the receiver enables the best possible receiver sensitivity to be achieved. The microwave signals are then down-converted within a mixer, to which a local oscillator signal is also applied. This translates the microwave returns to a much lower frequency, known as the intermediate frequency, or IF. The frequency of the IF is equal to the difference between the frequencies of the incoming RF returns and the local oscillator. Down converting signals to the lower IF allows simpler amplification and filtering to be applied and ultimately the signal will be digitized. All the characteristics of the incoming returns including its spectrum are preserved in the down conversion process but the signal incurs a power loss. This is why it is best to have an LNA before the mixer since otherwise the loss through the mixer degrades sensitivity. A receiver would then typically provide some bandpass filtering so as to accept only the returns on the correct channel frequency and reject out of band interference. It is easier to implement the filter in the IF than at the full microwave frequency as a lower Q factor is required within the IF. Additional isolation of transmitter leakage and reflections is then necessary before further amplification stages. A second isolation switch reinforces the action of the protection switch and provides the additional isolation to prevent any false targets due to any residual leakage of the transmitted signal. This is all pretty standard receiver architecture, but the key to providing interference rejection lies in the timings of the control gating signals to the two switches and the performance of the bandpass filter between them. These components are highlighted in the light grey shading. The mixer and LNA are practical necessities but play no part in the interference rejection. If we imagine that a radar is receiving continuous wave CW interference from another radar, we can avoid any effects due to the pulsed nature of pulsed interference and concentrate on the action of the receiver. Let's imagine that the CW interference is within the bandwidth of the microwave front end of the receiver but not on the same channel as the receiver and so not within the passband of the filter in the IF section of the receiver. The waveforms top right show the signals at various points within the receiver. Waveform A shows the gating control to the protection switch, that is, the first switch in the receiver just before the LNA. This switch will chop the incoming CW interference into a series of pulses that are subsequently amplified by the LNA and down converted in the mixer and enter the bandpass filter. The pulsed modulation imparted by the RF protection switch now results in a spectrum of sidebands extending into neighbouring channels and some of those sidebands will now fall within the passband of the bandpass filter. The output of the bandpass filter is waveform B and consists of a series of impulses at the rising and falling edges of the pulse. 
and the suppressed carrier component between these impulses. The carrier component falls outside the filter pass band and so is attenuated by the filter. The impulses are the differentiated pulses and contain the spectral components falling within the filter pass band. In other words, the in-band components falling within the receiver channel bandwidth. The switching of the RF protection switch has generated a spectrum extending into the receiver passband, thus increasing the level of interference accepted by the receiver. Arguably, the RF protection switch has made matters worse, but it has to be included so as to protect the LNA. Conceivably, the RF protection switch could impart pulse shaping so as to minimise the spectral spread. But this is difficult to engineer in practice and furthermore results in a gradual switching on and off of the receiver and so affects its ability to receive returns towards the beginning and end of the receiving period. Pulse shaping of the receiver, either in the protection switch or isolation switch, is not a realistic proposition. If we nest the gating control to the isolation switch within the gating control to the protection switch, these impulses can be gated out. Waveform C illustrates the isolation switch control with 200 nanoseconds nesting at both ends. That is, the isolation switch closes 200 nanoseconds after the protection switch closes and therefore 200 nanoseconds after the start of the rising edge impulse and it opens again 200 nanoseconds before the protection switch opens and so 200 nanoseconds before the start of the falling edge impulses. The isolation switch therefore gates out all the impulses and therefore the inbound interference and is shown in waveform D. The only interference that now remains is the out-of-band carrier component which has been attenuated by the filter and pulse modulated by the isolation switch, plus any leakage of the impulses due to the finite isolation of the isolation switch. The 200 nanoseconds nesting illustrated here was a somewhat arbitrary choice for illustrative purposes. In practice, nesting of a few tens of nanoseconds is adequate, depending on the filter design. The close-up views on the right illustrate the rising and falling edges of the waveforms for 30 nanoseconds of nesting. The nesting delay should be kept as low as possible because it introduces a short dead time at the start and end of the receiving period, which would increase eclipsing losses. The nesting time that is required depends on the duration of the impulses, so these should be kept as sharp as possible. Short, sharp impulses require a rapid rise and fall time of the protection switch, a wide filter bandwidth, and a non-dispersive path between the two switches, particularly through the bandpass filter. There are many competing influences on the filter design that are key to the successful rejection of interference, and we will look at these now. To reiterate the points made on the previous slide, the design of the bandpass filter is crucial to the success of the interference rejection. On the one hand, the filter design must support short, sharp impulses of in-band interference, whilst at the same time maximise the suppression of out-of-band interference. Short impulses are maintained when there is a large frequency difference between the filter passband and the interference. The large frequency difference means that when the interference is pulsed by the protection switch, it is only the very high harmonics of the PRF that fall within the filter passband, and high order harmonics at high offset frequencies are of short duration. This is simply stating that high frequencies have short periods. Another way of understanding this is to say that the filter action more closely conforms to differentiation of the input pulses 
when the carrier frequency is well above the passband. In the limit, the impulses would have the same duration as the rise and fall times imparted by the protection switch for perfect differentiation. A wide filter passband provides minimal distortion of the impulses. A narrow band filter would ring in response to the input pulses and so would prolong the impulses. A wide bandwidth, however, keeps the impulses sharp. Filter time constant is inversely proportional to bandwidth, and so short impulses are supported by a wide band. However, the bandwidth should not be so wide as to compromise its ability to reject out-of-band interference. Resistive losses must be minimized as they introduce damping which would lengthen the impulses. The impulses are rich in frequency content across the filter passband. Any dispersion across this band would also lengthen the impulses. It is important that the filter and any other circuits between the RF protection switch and the isolation switch are non-dispersive over the filter passband, as any dispersion would increase the rise and fall time of the pulses and so increase the impulse durations that can be achieved by the differentiation process. The receiver designs described on the previous slides have been modelled in order to quantify the rejection of CW interference. The model is based on typical parameters for a high PRF pulse Doppler waveform for an air-to-air -air velocity track while scan mode of an airborne intercept or fire control radar. The radar PRF is 250 kHz, that is, a pulse repetition interval of 4 microseconds. The transmitted pulse width is 1.5 microseconds, therefore leaving a receiving period of 2.5 microseconds and giving a duty ratio of 37.5%. Such systems typically operate at NATO I band, that is 8 to 10 gigahertz. The RF carrier frequency is unimportant to the model, but what is important is the IF center frequency. In this case, the IF is centered at 100 megahertz. An 8 pole Butterworth bandpass filter is modeled having an insertion loss of 1.6 dB at 100 megahertz and a 3 dB bandwidth of 27.5 megahertz. This gives a time constant of 1 over 27.5 megahertz equaling 36 nanoseconds. Therefore, impulses lasting around 36 nanoseconds can be expected. In practice, the modeled impulses are often a little shorter. The model also includes the effects of any dispersion through the filter, but dispersion within its passband is negligibly low. Initially, CW interference that is downconverted to 160 MHz is applied. This falls some 60 MHz above the IF center frequency. The attenuation provided by the bandpass filter at 160 MHz is 26.0 dB. That is some 24.4 dBs more than the insertion loss at 100 MHz. The protection switch is modelled as having a rise and fall time of 10 nanoseconds, which is typical of a high power pin diode switch. The rise and fall profiles are cosine in voltage. These rise and fall times will limit the impulse duration to at least 10 nanoseconds. The isolation switch has a rise and fall time of 1 nanosecond. Since the isolation switch will now define the pulses of interference, the rapid rise and fall times of the isolation switch will result in a broad spectrum of interference. In this way, the model assesses the interference rejection under pessimistic conditions. If the isolation switch had a longer rise and fall time, 
such that a degree of shaping were to be imparted onto the edges of the interference, even better levels of rejection would be possible. The timings of the isolation switch are nested 30 nanoseconds within the 50% points of the rising and falling edges of the protection switch. The degree of nesting required to fully gate out the impulses can be expected to be around the 36 nanosecond filter time constant, but no less than the 10 nanosecond protection switch rise and fall times. The 30 nanoseconds nesting was arrived at partly through trial and error, but gave a good compromise between achieving effective interference rejection without incurring too much extra eclipsing loss. The 30 nanoseconds nesting on both edges gives rise to a total dead time of 60 nanoseconds, and this amounts to an additional 0.21 dB eclipsing loss for the pulse timings used here. Eclipsing losses would be lower for a lower PRF or longer pulse width. In a fully engineered solution, it would be necessary to delay the timings of the isolation switch control to compensate for the group delay of the signal path between the protection switch and isolation switch. The spectral responses of the various signals are shown in the graph on the right. The dark blue is the spectrum of the 160 MHz interference signal once it has been pulse modulated by the protection switch. The sidebands at 100 MHz are 56.5 dBs below its peak response. The red line represents the profile of the bandpass filter and confirms an insertion loss of 1.6 dB at 100 MHz and attenuation of 26 dB at 160 MHz. The green spectrum corresponds to that of the interference signal on the filter output. We can see the 26 dB of suppression of its carrier component at 160 MHz, but the sidebands at 100 MHz have received almost no attenuation and sit at minus 58.1 dB. In fact, they have been subject to the 1.6 dB filter insertion loss only. The interference from these high-order PRF harmonics is manifest within the impulses. Once the impulses have been gated out by the isolation switch, we now see the suppressed 160 MHz carrier pulse modulated by the isolation switch, as shown in the cyan spectrum. This spectrum decays to 79.3 dBs below the original peak level of the interference at 100 MHz, which represents an improvement of 21.2 dB over the spectrum on the filter output, the green spectrum. One might expect a 26 dB improvement, as this is the rejection of the filter at 160 MHz, but this isn't quite achieved due to the very fast switching of the isolation switch and the additional 0.21 dB eclipsing loss. In fact, the level of improvement that is possible is limited by either the filter rejection at the carrier frequency of the interference or by the insertion loss of the isolation switch when open, whichever is the lower. In practice, switches having an isolation of 80 dBs are possible, and indeed several switches may be ganged in series to improve upon this. So it is the filter rejection that limits the levels of interference rejection. The 21.2 dB improvement cited here represents the improvement over filtering alone given that a protection switch on the receiver front end will always be required in a pulsed radar. Interference at 160 MHz corresponds to a plus 60 MHz offset with respect to the IF center frequency. For a channel spacing frequency of 20 MHz, the interference at 160 MHz could be thought of as being three channels higher. The level of interference rejection for interference on other frequencies is tabulated here.
The left hand column gives the offset frequency of the interference and the middle column is the level of filter rejection at the interference frequency. The level of improvement through the isolation switch is tabulated in the right hand column. In general, this improvement increases with increasing offset frequency, but is always somewhat below the corresponding level of filter rejection. At offset frequencies of minus 60 and minus 80 MHz, the interference falls at 40 MHz and 20 MHz respectively within the IF. At such low frequencies, the filter provides very high levels of rejection, but the impulses are slightly longer and are not fully gated out with 30 nanoseconds of nesting. When the nesting is increased to 50 nanoseconds, better levels of rejection are obtained, but at the expense of slightly higher eclipsing losses. Small improvements are seen for other offset frequencies, but the level of improvement is marginal and does not justify the additional eclipsing losses. So, to summarise. An effective solution to the problems of mutual interference between like radars requires a solution to both the transmitted waveform and the receiver. It is better to implement RF solutions that avoid creating and accepting interference in the first place than to rely on processing alone to circumvent problems. The transmitter solution is to shape the pulses so that the spectral content is less powerful at neighbouring channel frequencies. A neat receiver technique has been described based on the timings of two switches either side of a bandpass filter, and which is most effective for high duty ratio pulsed waveforms, but would be beneficial in all pulsed radars. The receiver technique described here offers considerable improvements over filtering alone. Those improvements are, in practice, limited by the rejection of the filter at the frequency of the interference. The receiver technique is also expected to give some degree of rejection of all forms of interference, not just the mutual interference between like radars, but does come at the cost of a small increase in eclipsing loss. Well, that concludes this video presentation from Whitehorse Radar. We hope you found it interesting and useful. Please feel free to browse our site. The address is at the bottom right of the screen. You may also contact us through the site if you have any questions or inquiries. In addition, if you navigate to our publications page, you can download the conference paper referenced on the contents slide for more information on the subject of this video. Goodbye.